Good evening. What a wonderful crowd. Um, happy to see so many people here tonight. I'm Patricia McDonald, director of the Wichita Art Museum. I hope that by this point all of you have been in the galleries and seen our spectacular daguerreotype uh, exhibition. I, I personally am just bewitched uh, by these images and I, I'll bring you in on a story a little bit for um, how we came to have this exhibition at the moment. Um, I've been mesmerized by this project and this collection and these uh, works of art since uh, I first viewed them as the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art opened their new building, the block building designed by Stephen Hall. And uh, think about this, as the museum was opening such a gorgeous new architectural masterpiece and they needed to make decision and weigh options for Gosh, what, what would they present? Yeah, probably, let's, let's think about something from our own collection. It's, we're gonna get a lot of media attention just for the building, and what, what do we have that is of greatest pride at the moment? They developed an exhibition of the Daguerreotype collection. And so that's when I first saw this work, and I've just been kind of haunted by it or um, taken by it um, ever since. And it just took me this long for, you know, working on our friend Keith Davis to finally uh, get an excerpt of that magnificent show um, here for our audiences um, in Wichita. And I'm really fascinated by Keith's talk this evening. Yes, talking about daguerreotypes, but really his frame or the lens that he has for looking at daguerre the daguerreotypes is this, is, this is the very inception of photography. And he believes that in this first moment, the essential ingredients of the medium of photography are already evident, are already there. So, you know, those of us who might scratch our head and wonder, really, you know, primary characteristics of photography, what might those be? Well, we're gonna learn something tonight. Uh, Keith is gonna share that knowledge with us, and we're really fortunate to gain this information from um, such an expert, one who really should know, our museum colleague um, from Kansas City, Keith Davis, has a very distinguished career. Um, and he's also fallen into what I would say a set or a series of really stellar opportunities. So Keith Davis is presently the senior curator of photography at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, an assignment that he accepted and took on in 2006. To go back to the very beginning of his career, he has um, a master's from the University of New Mexico, um, and that is one of the places, if you're studying photography, that you wanna do your graduate work. He then did a short stint at the George Eastman House, and he landed his first sort of um, meaty job, if you will, as the corporate curator for Hallmark Cards. That was in 1979. And apparently they really liked Keith because they kept him. And he evolved from curator to curator of collections to chief curator to fine art program director. And he is still the chair of their art selection committee while he is now a curator at the Nelson Atkins Museum. In a 30 year span of association with Hallmark, Keith expanded their art collection to more than 2,500 works of art. Um, and additionally, he built their photography collection from um, not that many to um, as the collection was gifted to the Nelson Atkins in 2005, 2006 in anticipation of the new wing, um, the collection at that point was 6,500 um, and it included representation of 900 artists. So in that span of time, that's the project that um, Keith accomplished. It's a collection that is, I would say, nationally and internationally known for both its depth and its quality. Um, and it, it, interestingly, as the Hallmark um, Corporation gifted the collection to the Nelson Atkins Museum, they also gifted Keith uh, because they've endowed his position there. They, um, he had a colleague at Hallmark Cards and sort of she came over the Nelson Atkins too. 
Um, and they also gave funds to establish endowment for continuing to build the collection, so to continuing to purchase and buy and, and build the um, collection. Um, so it's, it's amazing. Keith and this story at Hallmark are so exceptional that he and it are now an entry in a 2007 book called Great Collectors of Our Time. So that gives you sort of the logistics of Keith and where he's been and this amazing collection that he's uh, built. But you, we, we, we need to also, I want to also acknowledge and um, make the point to you that he's a, a vibrant scholar with a bright, bright mind and a, an incredible uh, record of publication. So um, across the years, he's authored books or catalogs on such photography greats as Harry Callahan, Dorothea Lange, Todd Webb, Frederick Summer, um, and he's also published uh, on other artists um, important projects, um, and some of these may or may not be names that people in the audience are aware of, but also written on Carl Van Fechten, Art Sinzebaugh, and the great, um, one, of the, one of the great Civil War photographers, um, George Bernard. His interests and, and sort of, you know, time in the archives um, research have led him to projects across the 19th and 20th and, of course, now 21st centuries of photography history. He has authored two major studies that sort of, I would say, bookend photography production. In 1995, he published An American Century of Photography from Dry Plate to Digital. Um, and in fact, that particular publication has gone into a second um, edition. In 2007, he uh, wrote and brought out The Origins of American Photography from Daguerreotype to Dry Plate from 1839 to 1885. Um, and the show that we have upstairs is really an, an excerpt of uh, that research. As that show, or uh, the exhibition was at the Nelson Atkins as they were opening their new building, an important reviewer um, claimed that it was, quote, one of the best shows of early American photography ever produced. And we have Keith here this evening to share with us sort of background and information and his love of daguerreotypes. Help me to welcome Keith Davis to Wichita. Thank you. After an introduction like that, I really think we should just go out and have a drink, but <laughs> we'll, <laughs> but I'll, I'll share some words with you before that time. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Good to see everyone. Thank you for coming out. I, I appreciate seeing everybody here. Um, and um, again, my thanks to Patricia and Lisa and the museum for mounting our show so beautifully. Uh, the, the, I think the pieces look awful good, no matter who had acquired them for whatever museum. <laughs> I, I would be very impressed. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to have it here, to share with the audience here. Um, the daguerreotype um, aspect of our collection really only began, only began, uh, well actually exactly 20 years ago. Um, it was uh, February of 1995 that I bought the first daguerreotype for the Hallmark Collection. Um, I hadn't thought that it, of the anniversary, but it's, it's exactly 20 years. Um, and the, between 95 and about 05, um, I, we were very, crazily passionate and energized about building the, the best collection possible. Um, and uh, there were some wonderful opportunities in that period. There, there are still some, but that was a especially opportune time, I think. Um, so that's what, what you see here is one of the tips of that iceberg. Um, I am not going to talk about technical stuff because the, those questions are easily answerable. You know, how do you make a daguerreotype and what is it and so forth. The daguerreotype, the daguerrean period is really just 20 years. It's, it's, that's amazing, 1839 to 1860. So really we're talking the 1840s, 1850s. Um, that short time span is important. Number two, the fact that every daguerreotype is a one-of-a-kind thing. It, it was like a Polaroid in the sense that 
you um, put one plate in the camera, made one exposure, and you got one original thing. And if you wanted to make another exposure, you started with another plate. So there's no negative. Every daguerreotype is truly one of a kind. And thirdly, it was invented in France, but um, it flourished in America. The Americans were the greatest daguerreotypists in the world. Much more active in the U.S. than in France and far more active in the U.S. than in Britain or any other country. So um, for a variety of reasons, America really claimed this process. And um, no other country on the planet r was remotely as accomplished um, at the daguerreotype as uh, the Americans. This is uh, an image by Daguerre, the inventor of photography. This is made in 1837 and is famous for the fact that it's the first image to record a living person, actually two people, the very slow shoeshine boy and the guy getting his boots shined. Um, you know, one of the great myths of the daguerreotype is that all the exposures were painfully slow, hours of time or whatever. This one is extremely early. This is 1837. And the truth is that this probably was 20 minutes. And so even this is basically high noon, middle of the day, streets full of traffic, all of that traffic disappears because of, I'm guessing, a 20 or 30 minute exposure, leaving these two people because they're not moving. So this is the beginning point. You know, the, at this period that the air type was um, uh, in an experimental stage and fairly crude, but it, it really was a revolution. And that's the theme of this talk. So in 1839, a cult, when the, the daguerreotype was introduced to the world officially, it, it was officially made public, a cultural big bang took place, the invention of photography by Jacques-Louis Mondé Daguerre. Daguerre achieved fame through his diorama, and this is um, a, not terribly readable, but a cutaway view of the diorama showing something of the complexity of the space. The point is that in this diorama space, giant paintings were shown that were transformed through alterations of lighting and other stagecraft, essentially, so that these paintings seem to transform over time and come alive, go from day to dust to night to morning again and so forth. Daguerre achieved fame through the diorama, a theatrical experience in which viewers watched a large painted scene come, apparently, to life thanks to clever stagecraft and manipulations of light. Daguerre was a commercial artist of a very particular kind. He was a master illusionist, someone who created virtual experiences that felt magically real. The illusion of reality and the new public reality of illusion were his stock and trade. Daguerre's interest in illusionistic images grew from his experience with the camera obscura, a sketching aid that has been known for uh, a couple centuries. And we've, most of us have seen these kind of cutaway views the camera obscura was a camera minus the ability to record images. So you have a lens, you have a 45 degree mirror, and you have frosted glass here, or simply a glass surface, on which you could put tracing paper, for example, and then very patiently trace the image cast on the paper. And this is a vintage camera obscura. The curious magic of these images, the images that you get on the ground glass, um, is familiar to any of us that have worked with traditional photography. Um, uh, the images on the ground glass of a view camera, 4x5 or 8x10 view camera, for example. And this is exactly what we're seeing. This is a, a, a recent artistic image by Mark Klatt um, showing the back of another photographer, Linda Connors, 8x10 camera, and the inverted image that's being thrown on that ground glass. But the shimmering kind of transparency and magic of that image on a ground glass is what was so fascinating to people like Daguerre and anyone that used a camera obscura. Back to Daguerre. Photography was created when the optical technology of the camera obscura was married with the chemical knowledge of how light sensitive emulsions could be made, but even more importantly, preserved. Uh, these two ideas, the lens formed image and the chemical means of preserving those images, give us photography as we know it. Um, and as, as the medium existed really up until 
you know, essentially now. Uh, this is one of the earliest daguerreotypes ever made in America. It is in the show. This is the uh, young photographer um, Inslee from New York. Um, this came from the fa Inslee family estate. Um, this image almost certainly was made in the first couple months of the daguerreotype existing in the U.S., meaning late 1839 or maybe January, February of 1840. It's, it, it's extremely early in the history of American photography. It's hard for us today to truly recapture the impact and the radical novelty of this first photographic process. In terms of human picture making, 1839 marks a kind of year zero. There is the pre-photographic era, the, the dividing line of 1839, and then everything that's come since. The daguerreotype but more broadly, photography itself changed our notion of pictorial accuracy and set a new standard for the very idea of visual truth. At the same time, as practitioners immediately understood, the process had its own language, its own nature, its own syntax. It was at once an art and a science. While it was not terribly hard, after a while at least, to make a daguerreotype, it required enormous skill and understanding to make them consistently to make them beautifully, and most difficult of all, to use the medium in a personal way, an expressive way, to create a body of work that really was, is identifiable as something by, you know, daguerreotypist X as opposed to Y, to convey an individual sense of invention and imagination. And I would add that uh, essentially all the images I'm showing here are from our collection. Um, there, there's more here than what's on view upstairs, but I, I wanted to give you a larger, a little bit larger sense of our holdings. In its day, the daguerreotype was held up as one of the three great inventions of the early 19th century, with the railroad and the telegraph. All three transformed the human meaning of time and space by increasing the average speed of travel by a factor of five or ten times, that is from an average walking speed of what, two or three miles an hour, to an early train could easily go 15 or 20 miles an hour and soon they're going 50 miles an hour. Um, by by uh, allowing this rapid, or this you know, really monumental jump in transportation speed, the railroad effectively collapsed space it brought distant communities closer together and facilitated trade and tourism. The impact of the telegraph was just as dramatic. The telegraph allowed news and information to be conveyed instantaneously, I mean literally, instantaneously across vast distances. In effect, the telegraph amplified the human voice and the speed of the postal service uh, by a million times. This is Recife, Brazil, by an American daguerreotypist that had uh, branches uh, down um, uh, along the coast of Brazil. Uh, this is uh, early 50s, probably 52, 53. Uh, whole plate, which is about as big as most daguerreotypes ever got, um, but unbelievable detail. Um, you, you could take a magnifying glass to this and you know, see all sorts of little things, the, the texture of bricks and so forth. Similarly, the daguerreotype represented both a new standard of pictorial accuracy and a technologically accelerated sense of speed. Typically today, we tend to think the daguerreotype is crude and slow, as for example in requiring um, you know, absurdly long exposure times. The, the, the typical exposure times in the daguerreotype period have been, like the, the reports of uh, Mark Twain's death, greatly exaggerated. Um, I mean, for example, this is a, a Gurney group portrait of a family done in his New York studio. The, this has a wonderful kind of relaxation and freshness and spontaneity. This is not an image um, showing people having to stand still for 20 minutes or some crazy thing. However, in order to recapture the process's original impact, we need to ask ourselves, slow in relation to what? If th these exposures were slower than what we're used to today, I accept that. Um, but how much slower and what did that really mean? So slow in relation to what? How long, in fact, really was a five or ten second exposure? This probably, you know, is in the neighborhood of five to ten, maybe fifteen seconds, in 1850. How did ten seconds compare with the experience of sitting for several hours or several days for a professional portrait painter? 
And that was what was required to have your portrait painted. By that standard, that is the real existing, existing standard of this time, 10 seconds was essentially instantaneous. It was essentially no time at all. And that is how the daguerreotype was encountered in its day. Not as slow, not as crude, but as astonishingly rapid, sophisticated, modern, and transformative. And in fact, we have such things as Daguerrean snapshots. Basically, this is in our collection. It's an astonishing thing that visually has all the characteristics of a 20th century snapshot. This sort of peculiar um, slice of time recording uh, something of importance to the, the person making the image, but you know, just just a, a wondrous sort of slice of everyday life. We don't think of this kind of image um, occurring, uh, certainly not prior to 1860, but there it is. So instead of focusing on presumed drawbacks of the process, again, the myth of eternally long exposure times, we might just as well ask um, about the virtues of the process and when those virtues were matched by any other technique. Um, for example, how long did it take for any other process to match the daguerreotype's uh, seeming transparency, its, its precision of description, um, its pearly luminescent tonal range? Um, in truth, the daguerreotype complicates any simplistic notion we might have about the nature and inevitability of technological progress. I mean, the answer to my question is it took generations for any other process to begin to match the technical quality that we see in these works. Later photographic processes are clearly different, but I'm really not willing to easily admit, at least, that different is automatically better. Um, and this one I'm showing for the amazing rendition of clouds. This, this piece, given the nature of the piece, is early 1850s. And clouds are not terribly common in the daguerreotype, but they could be recorded. It was mostly a time of day thing. And here we have this magnificent rendition of clouds that, quite frankly, we don't get again in photography, honestly, until we're, we're basically into the 20th century. So these are these technical things that, um, again, if, if we are focusing at all on the drawbacks of the process. We, we, we need to be realistic about those, that they actually weren't terrible drawbacks, but we also need to address the, posit the virtues of the process that didn't come around again for quite some time. So early daguerreotypes are pretty crude. Uh, this is an 1841 piece by Samuel Bemis, who did a whole series of landscapes up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. These are very early. They're ungilded. They're low in contrast. Um, they're, they're primitive in feeling. Um, but again, this is 1841. By 43, certainly, by 42, 43, the process was already so sophisticated that plates, plates from that period can look just as good as plates from, you know, the 1850s. But certainly by 1844, 45, <laughs> typical Daguerrean production across the country is at a superbly high level. The daguerreotype was publicly announced in uh, August of 1839 and was made commercially practical over the following few years. <clears throat> Even as it became an increasing part of everyday life, it was seen as both a technical marvel and a philosophical puzzle. This is a Vance uh, whole plate from San Francisco. A particular politician, or, or actually newspaper editor, had been assassinated on the street and uh, this, all of this was in his honor. The Metropolitan has a, uh, another plate taken from the same vantage point with, uh, probably taken within 10 minutes of this with the guys in slightly different positions. But uh, the, uh, this plate I'm showing at this point in the talk because again of its uh, astonishing, almost surreal kind of precision of detail where you can take a magnifying glass to it and see more and more. The words used to describe the daguerreotype <clears throat> when it was made public um, conv clearly convey a sense of both amazement and uncertainty. It was called sun painting, the mirror with a memory, a revolution in art, and a miracle. One writer noted that 
the, quote, exquisite perfection of these images almost transcends the bounds of sober belief, unquote. So there was at once something both real and almost kind of surreal about the daguerreotype. It was clear to everyone at the time that it was a kind of art. The question was what kind? It truly was revolutionary enough that the answers to these questions weren't obvious. It, it's, it's really a matter of looking at the actual production that, that was created in this time to discover what the answers are. In fact, it was immediately recognized by practitioners that in every act of recording the world, photography, in fact, creates its own pictorial world. I would suggest that what photographs do, what they always have done and will continue to do, is a single act of recording and transforming. Recording and transforming at this is one act. This dialectic of description and invention has produced the modern universe of photographs in which we have all grown up. And the daguerreotype forms the bedrock of this entire history of lens-based imaging. It is the fount from which everything we know, everything we think about modern still lens-based imaging um, derives brought back. The DNA of photography as we know it goes directly back to the Daguerrean period. The daguerreotype came into the world as a kind of miracle or magic and was quickly made practical. It was put in the hands of thousands of professionals of widely varying abilities and applied to a broad range of everyday concerns. And what was the result of that? <clears throat> Um, this is one of the great self-portraits. Actually, this is in the show upstairs, you can see, and they've, they've made this marvelous blow-up. And the plane of focus here is on the daguerreotypist's face. Um, the camera is a little bit in advance of that plane, so it goes a hair soft. But in the enlargement upstairs, which is like times 200 or something, the, the face is unbelievably sharp. So it gives you a little bit of a hint of how much information is contained in these pictures to begin with. At any rate, we have a daguerreotypist in action. He's looking at a sitter who's off the frame. And what he's, he's making the exposure. Uh, what he's got in his hand is the uh, lens cap. And so he's making his six or eight or 10 second exposure by simply getting the sitter ready, making sure everything's right, and then uncapping the camera. One, two, three, four, seven, eight, whatever putting the lens cap back. That's what's being depicted in this, this image. And so the stillness and the implied sense of this duration of time, I think is very beautiful in terms of what this guy actually was doing. In America, logically, the daguerreotype first flourished in leading cities where there was a concentration of both intellectual and technological resources, um, supply houses for chemicals, lens makers, um, uh, a, a good cabinet maker would have been hired to make early cameras until they were manufactured uh, commercially. Um, and cities, of course, had populations that would support commercial practice. So in the early days, we see the daguerreotype develop uh, most rapidly in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, um, and then pretty quickly after that in a number of other cities, Cincinnati, um, upstate New York, Cleveland, St. Louis, and so forth. All of those cities played an important role in the development of the medium in America. Um, and all the cities up to St. Louis, and unfortunately not much past St. Louis, had great daguerreotype studios. Um, the population of Kansas City was just too small um, in the Daguerrean era to really support any real Daguerrean community. And from KC West until you get to California. Um, there's basically nothing. Um, another daguerreotypist in his studio, he's jammed all his equipment up in this very small space to, to sort of show off. So he's got a six plate camera, half plate camera, posing seat, um, a headrest, another headrest, decorative element here. The column, these columns were typically on wheels so they could be shoved around the studio. And this remarkable daguerreotype um, of a daguerrean studio, this outer room is, was obviously the sitting room. We see a headstand here. We see framed daguerreotypes on the wall. This is probably a painting. 
I mean, daguerreotypes just didn't come that big, but these are clearly daguerreotypes. And then the daguerreotypist himself in the back room, uh, presumably assembling uh, a, a finished plate for a client. And this is a mirror image, of course, like all daguerreotypes, and I'm pretty sure this is no admittance over the door here. But this is the only known daguerreotype like this that gives you a, a, a hint of a smaller kind of operation. Um, this doesn't feel to me like a big New York studio. This, this feels to me a, a bit more uh, provincial. But um, it's, it's just a remarkable image. I've, I've never seen another one um, like this at all. And there were itinerant daguerreotypists too. This is a traveling daguerrean wagon <coughs> where a daguerreotypist with some horses would go from town to town. So they would serve audiences that did not have their own resident daguerreotypist. Um, the big window here means that you know, it would be oriented so that you'd get nice light coming through and the, the, the seating would, uh, the subject would be photographed near that window. And then presumably the back end would be for processing and so forth. Um, the animation here is amazing. This kid, the guy, um, exuberantly hand colored. Uh, this is from about 1856 and shows you the high end of the Daguerrean studio business. This is the Frederick Studio in New York City uh, on Broadway. This would be the entrance down here, framed um, uh, photographs, both paper prints and daguerreotypes. You'd come up to the probably the second floor. Well, he would have had several floors. Typically, the posing room in a big studio would be the top floor because you could have a skylight. So typically, the posing room would be up here and maybe processing and in the waiting room on, on subsequent floors uh, coming down. Um, the flamboyance of this facade is pretty great. This is Frederick's Photographic Temple of Art <laughs> in these giant letters. And then this fabulous symbolism. This is an eagle, a camera, and the sun. So you have patriotism, technology, and the forces of nature all working together in this photographic temple of art to, to elevate the national character and to make money, um, to give Americans a faithful image of themselves. Um, but this, this sort of rhetorical thing, I think, is extremely interesting and really suggests that the great Daguerrean studios are more than just businesses. They were businesses, but they were businesses with this larger aura of progress, of patriotism, of pride in um, skills, uh, national taste, and so forth. Um, the best of these daguerreotypists were known nationally and even internationally. And some of the, the, the names from the time include uh, the, the great Boston daguerreotypist, John Adams Whipple. This is a Whipple of the wife of the New York State governor, um, smiling as she's pointing a rifle. And this is the, the rack of whatever critter she's bagged um, on their vacation. But you know, this, this marvelous, image of, you know, woman power that I think certainly cuts against the grain of what we would assume to be the kind of exclusive representation of women in this period. Um, this one is, a, is about another facet of character. Uh, the other great Boston team, Southworth and Hawes, uh, were famous for um, never underpricing their plates. They, they charged twice what their competitors charged, and they still had great business. Um, this is a whole plate a group portrait of a, a girl's class uh, uh, school, uh, a girl's school. Uh, what's so beautiful is the way they've orchestrated the figures across the, the plane of the, the image. This vignette here, this grouping here, the, the pair back by the window, this wonderful grouping in here, another grouping there, another here, another here. Um, this is a group portrait, but it breaks down into this wonderfully sort of rich text of narrative relationships and um, connections between people. Um, and it is an example of their absolute mastery of the process. In New York, there are a number of great studios. I showed the, the slide of the Frederick Studio. 
The, um, uh, this is by Anson, um, who ran one of the major studios in New York. Uh, the kid is holding his pet chicken. And this points up the fact that daguerreotypists were, daguerreotypists had their own ideas, clearly, but they were there to serve the interests of their clients. And if clients walked in with a certain idea, as long as it wasn't literally banned in Boston or whatever, the, the daguerreotypists would do it. Or, you know, and they could bring in whatever they wanted to to be part of the image. And so many of these great portraits in particular should be seen as some kind of collaboration between an extremely talented daguerreotypist and a subject with their own mind, their own point of view, their own message that they wanted to convey. And that dialectic is, uh, can be very, very interesting. Great daguerreotypist in Philadelphia. This is by the Langenheim brothers. It's a portrait of John Greenleaf Whittier, the great poet. Pretty early, this is probably 40, uh, 44, 44, 45. Um, in Albany, New York, this is by Churchill. This is in the exhibition. What's a little hard to see in the exhibition, what's easy to see in the exhibition is the beauty of the hand coloring and just the, the, the wonderfully kind of original notion of posing that he's got. What's a little harder to see in the exhibition, but it's there, is the fact that Churchill signed his plates. He had a very sharp little tool and he signed the bottom of the plates, Churchill. Um, the signing of daguerreotypes is really rare, but there were a handful of daguerreotypists that did it. And that notion of authorship of you know, authoring or, or literally signing a plate the way a painter routinely signs a painting is, is quite interesting. Again, rare but, but fascinating. Uh, McDonnell up in Buffalo, New York. This is in the exhibition. Uh, kind of a flamboyantly over the top uh, portrait of a uh, local uh, Native American or someone of Native American descent at least with this gorgeous headdress, some hand coloring done there, obviously. Uh, nearby in Niagara Falls, Platt Babbitt had the concession to make daguerreotypes um, on the American side of the falls. And what his business uh, consisted of waiting for elegant groups of visitors to come and stand there and enjoy the view. He would probably orchestrate them a little bit, but he'd make a, an image, a whole, typically whole plate, and then sell it to them as they left. And in this time, it was mostly wealthy people that went to the falls anyway, and so many of them said, great, you know, let's, let's buy that and take it home. What a, what a fantastic souvenir. So these kinds of plates traveled all over the country uh, after the, immediately after they were made. This is in the show, uh, William North of Cleveland, the, his great fisherman daguerreotype. Um, this is clearly more than a portrait. It's even more than an occupational portrait. This is, um, you know, a, a work of art. This is a, uh, a vision of the American dandy, you know, of 1854 or 5 or whatever. Um, an absolute masterpiece. Cincinnati had a very lively Daguerrean community. This is by Ezekiel Hawkins, a half plate of the uh, steamer Jacob Strader. Um, there is also a great um, African-American daguerreotypist in Cincinnati named Ball, J.P. Ball, um, who made plates like this. This is in the exhibition. But it's, it's very interesting to realize that there weren't many African-American daguerreotypists, but there were a handful of extremely talented ones who very obviously were not dependent on, um, you know, a black clientele. Um, J.P. Ball was you know, in the elite of his field in Cleveland and uh, photographed the, the upper echelon of society and, and middle class subjects as well. And St. Louis had a uh, great daguerreotypist. Thomas Easterly is one of the most astonishing. He made outdoor daguerreotypes that no one else tried to do or could do at the time. Uh, this is a quarter plate of uh, an elephant. <laughs> Um, probably a visiting circus coming through town, but what an astonishing concept. Um, and again, this had to be at least a few seconds. And so it took skill on his part to, to sense when whatever motion was going on, when that was sort of coming to a temporary stop, and that's when he made the exposure. 
But again, an image like this tells us very clearly that all daguerreotypes did not require two-minute exposures, that many of them, in fact, could be done with surprisingly brief exposure times. One important key idea here is that the daguerreotype process is, well, as, as the Easterly pointed up, the daguerreotype process is surprisingly flexible. It allowed a great variety of images to be made um, under a variety of conditions, indoors and out. And the process also allowed considerable interpretive latitude, um, that is, ideas of personal style, um, personal approaches, uh, traits, and so forth. Um, were expressed in the daguerreotype. Um, the business of the daguerreotype was fundamentally the port portrait business. Um, probably 95% of all existing daguerreotypes today are portraits, and most of them are pretty routine portraits. But that's where the money was. That, that was the bread and butter work for professional daguerreotypists. Uh, this pair of plates, I think, is quite interesting because it's the same three girls maybe 10 or 15 years later in the same pose. And that jump in time is quite beautiful and poignant, but also points up the fact that, that middle and upper uh, class folks often went back to the daguerreotype studio on a fairly regular basis. Um, the, these things were somewhat expensive for the day, but they were affordable. You know, For anyone that really wanted a daguerreotype portrait, they were affordable. Um, you know, tip the, 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 the bottom end would have been about a dollar and a half at the time for a six plate portrait, which in today's money is probably $60 or, or in that kind of range. So $60, I mean, you need to think about it, but it's not, it's not the end of the world. It's, it's a, a, a restaurant tab. You know, that's, that's basically the equivalent. Well, at a cheap restaurant. Um, So portraiture was the bread and butter of work. Um, most of the surviving portraits are pretty straightforward, but certainly not all. And what I suggested before, that a variety of things could happen in the Daguerrean studio, um, is, is an important idea. That is, the play between the daguerreotypist's ability and ideas and the interests of the subjects. You know, the subjects that are paying to have this picture made, they have a say in what it's going to look like. And that dynamic, I think, is quite interesting. Um, one of the genres of the daguerreotype, one of the most playful and, and fun genres, is that of the semi-hidden parent or the parent off to the side. Photographing kids was very difficult, and so often parents were called in to calm them or reassure them or whatever, or in some cases just to you know, hang out on the edge of the image to comfort the kids. So we see a third of the father here. Or this fabulous picture of the hiding mother who is there holding the kid and in fact actually sort of pushing the kid slightly forward so she's the plane of focus. Um, but you know, this wacky kind of idea that, um, uh, that comes through in these images, these images have a surprising casualness as well as a radical sense of improvisation and contingency. And I would propose that images such as this could only have been made with the camera. I really can't imagine any painter being commissioned to paint this. It just, it wouldn't make any sense. The subject was the kid. And so if you took the kid to a painting studio, painter studio, the mother might very well be holding the kid there, but the mother would not be in the resulting painting or not this way. So, so th this, the, this whole genre, if nothing else, it points up the, uniquely, the, the unique pictorial nature of the, the photographic process. Uh, a girl holding a daguerreotype. On a more formal level, daguerreotype portraits range from a kind of folk art simplicity, which I think we see illustrated here and here to an elite high art perfection of lighting, pose, and composition. This remarkable, beautiful, graceful, and yet completely real image. Or this. <laughs> um, 
So in, within this high art tradition, photographers came up with many ways to pose their subjects in addition to using props and lighting in varied ways. So we have pairs of people. The group portrait posed a particular compositional problem. And this image, I think, is positively inspired, a delightful, wonderfully rhythmic exploration of complementary poses, glances, and expressions. It's not just lining up six people and banging away. Um, there, there's a, a wonderful kind of purely visual pictorial energy in this image. There are also very surprisingly candid images, uh, spontaneous images made in the studio. This one, which I interpret as an older brother and a younger brother having their picture made, doing what they often did, was, which was beat on each other's shoulders, you know. Um, but it's kind of astonishing. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, I didn't know this kind of daguerreotype existed. When, that was part of my enthusiasm and excitement in building up this collection to realize that this kind of daguerreotype absolutely did exist, and it changed my understanding of this whole first period in American photography. Or this, this wonderfully sweet portrait of a mother with all of this great activity, a blurred kid here, another one peeking along here, um, you know, one has to presume that, that she was the primary subject, but the daguerreotypist was smart enough to just sort of let this happen. And that kind of energy and spontaneity is there. This is not a stiff, posed, well, I mean, it's posed, but it's not a stiff, dead kind of image. It has a whole different kind of life to it. Um, and then just the quality of seeing uh, by the great portrait daguerreotypist. This is by Montgomery Simons, who had studios in Philadelphia and elsewhere on the East Coast. Um, one of my favorite portraits, I, I, I love the complexity of the glances, the, the body language, and then the glances, the older husband looking at the younger wife, the younger wife looking out into space, the full description of the figure, this dark, sort of somber background. There's a profound psychology going on here that I think is, is very powerful. It becomes all the more interesting when we realize that uh, these are painted portraits of those two people, the old, slightly older husband and the slightly younger wife. And uh, as I said the other day, in the old days, art historians loved to bash photography by showing a lousy photograph and a brilliant painting, you know, a Picasso painting and a postcard picture to basically say, you know, isn't, isn't photography pretty feeble, really? It's only good to inspire the great painters. Well, there's some of that. My, I'm taking a little bit of pride here in doing the reverse because I just do not think there's any contest between the quality of these images and the quality of that portrait. But this is part of the potency of what the daguerreotype portrait could be. It was a whole new way of looking at people and in the hands of the brilliant operators of interpreting people, of suggesting layers of psychology that these do not do. They just do not do it. A frequently asked question is why does no one smile in the daguerreotype? <laughs> ah! Now that's a surprise. Who knew that was here? In fact, of course, there are mm, smilers, um, although they're fairly rare. All right, why, is the, why are they rare? Number one, yes, it's hard to hold a smile for 10 seconds. I'll grant that. But it's far from impossible, right? He did it. Fundamentally, it's about something else. It's not about exposure times. Fundamentally, I believe people were somber in these portraits, typically, because they were trying to express something really key about character, about their character. They're trying to express a basic seriousness of character, a dignity, an inner sense of gravity that could only be conveyed in a relaxed, normal state of being, and definitely not in the strained, artificial condition of faking a smile. Um, this is more what we expect from this period. Uh, for a Victorian adult, the idea of being portrayed with a big grin would have been considered childish or smart-alecky. My grandparents never, you know, whenever we did family pictures, they didn't do this. They, they were still part of that generation where, you know, it was, it was a serious thing to be photographed and you, you were photographed in a serious way. Um, 
it would have been considered childish or smart alecky. We might ask in turn why we insist on being portrayed smiling. A smile conveys a social message, for sure, a generic sense of pleasantness. You know, it's, it's sort of a trigger that, a signal that, you know, I'm not gonna attack you, I'm not, I'm not your enemy. Um, but, you know, it's interesting to just contemplate what do we expect from a portrait today? What is the convention of smiling all about? What did people uh, 150 years ago expect from a portrait? What were their conventions and so forth? Um, Something has changed. You know, it's, uh, it, w we think differently about images of ourselves. And uh, I don't have any answer to that, but I, but I think it's a very uh, fascinating and, and uh, telling kind of um, uh, idea. What is our understanding of our essential self and how might it differ from the understanding of 150 years ago? Speaking of the self, the daguerreotype was dominant in the era that saw the rise of something like modern celebrity culture. And in fact, this is Charles Sumner, the senator from New York, who was a great abolitionist and very well known at the time. There was a demand and a market for portraits of famous people, and most of these celebrities knew exactly how to use the power of the image to promote themselves, essentially, to um, spread their, their um, uh, a, an image of themselves that, that, that they actively shaped. So our collection has a number of um, portraits of important people. This is John Brown, the abolitionist. And this is taken by Augustus Washington, the African-American daguerreotypist in Hartford, Connecticut. Pr probably the first daguerreotype ever made of John Brown. Frederick Douglass, who was a genius at um, the creation of images of himself and really a, a magnificent photographic subject. Tom Thumb and his mother and Jenny Lind, the great singer, one of the most famous people of the 19th century. This made in a um, uh, St. Louis, well, this is in the show, uh, St. Louis daguerreotypist. And then we have the occupational. Questions of personal and economic identity were central to the genre of the occupational, the depiction of an individual with some evidence of their trade or calling. These exist in considerable variety. Uh, nearly all professions, it seems, are represented in one way or another in the great social register of the daguerreotype. So of course we have our polka dotted clown. We have a fraternal uh, member. I'm not sure whether that's a ma Masonic or he's, he's obviously part of some fraternal order, but fabulous pose with the outfit and taking the pledge. Uh, a dentist with some nice teeth here and the tools to pull all your teeth, uh, a mesmerist, which represents the very begin, the sort of proto beginning of modern psychology. Uh, phrenology, this is a major, a college major that's really fallen by the wayside. <laughs> I, I, it, you'd think there'd be great potential today. Uh, um, a chiropodist, a foot doctor. This is not a dead guy. This is a living subject, but he's working on, a uh, chiropodist worked on the nails and uh, feet, so corns, bunions, what have you. Um, but a, an amazing occupational portrait of him at work. A minister in his church, this sort of uh, environmental portrait is uh, quite unusual. I've, I've never seen another ex really quite like this one. And of course, a gold miner, California gold miner. Uh, and from our book, we've got several spreads of a variety of occupational, some of which I've shown you in larger images here. In these images, we see a very different approach to portraiture and to basic ideas of character than we typically find in portraits today. An occupational portrait is by definition a revelation of more than simple appearance. It suggests otherwise invisible things, such as personal or professional interests and aptitudes. And by implication, it suggests one's position in the social hierarchy, the social register. An occupational portrait is more than simply a record of physical appearance. It's a rich indication of character and talents and of one's place in the overall fabric of society. And that I find to be a, a, a really very interesting uh, notion. And again, that's 
looking to the idea of portraiture, I think, in a much richer way than we typically do today, um, for whatever reason. Um, the, the, these images are about person X who did such and such, who knew, who had such and such talents. You know, it, it gives us the person and something of a story. And that's, again, a richer thing than, than someone in a suit smiling, you know, which, which again is our default today. Uh, there, this is an environmental uh, portrait, if you will, this amazing uh, whole plate interior of a butcher shop <clears throat> with posed figures, hanging meat that's been hand colored. These splotches here, when I very first saw the plate, I thought were plate flaws. In fact, they're not at all. They're direct beams of sunlight coming through the windows and doors of this shop. So it's just one more indication that this really, truly was made in a butcher shop. This is not a studio creation or setup. Um, these images have all sorts of things to tell us about the character and values of the culture itself, 19th century America. The theme of the African American attendant or nanny with a white child is to my mind an extraordinarily potent and poignant theme. This is Enoch Long who is in St. Louis. We really can't view these images as simple in any way. They are emblems of America's legacy of racial oppression, uh, really uh, kind of uh, evidence of America's historical guilty conscience. The sadness, the endurance, and the sense of nurturing care that we see on these black faces is deeply moving and unforgettable. Uh, this image, for example, of a, a wealthy man, son, and their Chinese servant who you know, it was important enough to get him in the picture, but not at all, uh, you know, on this level. He, he, he was given the remaining space in the picture. So this message is very poignant and tough. Uh, it's positive in the sense that he was valued enough to be part of the picture, but in this way. There's another class of images ones that don't quite feel like classical occupationals that also suggest more than simple appearance. Two women playing chess, for example. Um, you don't find portraits of women in, uh, like this very often. This is typically a male kind of motif, playing cards, checkers, chess, uh, gaming in one way or another. But it's fascinating that these women chose to have themselves portrayed in this manner. In images like this, people have chosen to have themselves portrayed with certain objects, certain objects that, that really meant, had particular meaning for them, or in particular narrative contexts that reveal something of their character or interests. A very unusual portrait, um, certainly not bordering on pornographic, but something very intimate, um, something very private, a private kind of moment, not a public moment. Um, we think of Daguerrean portraits as, you know, pretty public kinds of things because, you know, unless you were a family of a daguerreotype, you had to go to someone's studio to have these things made. So how and why this was made, we just don't know. But it's, it's a remarkably different kind of depiction uh, given this kind of intimacy. Some of these images are intensely personal. They are about an intimate revelation of the self and a deeply personal communion of sentiment or emotion or attachment. Uh, two plates that uh, had originally been in one case, like they are here. Um, I bought one of these plates in 1996 from one dealer. I bought the other plate in 1997 from another dealer. And it was only after I got the second one back to Kansas City did I realize that not simply were, was this kind of similar to this other one, it was the same guys. And we were able to, we reunited this pair of plates. But th th these two are not straightforward portraits. They're commemorations of a relationship, friendship, brothers, business partners, whatever they are. Um, smoking, drinking, clinking glasses, you know, doing guy things. Um, but, but there is this wonderful genre of the, for lack of a better term, the relational portrait. You know, a, a portrait that's about the connection between the subjects in the scene. And this fabulous uh, image by Zeely of South Carolina, all this incredible animation here. 
Um, these are, these guys are probably not ministers, I, I would guess. <laughs> I, I'm just guessing, but they look like card sharks or something. Um, so what, what was an image like this all about? Uh, all about? These women very clearly um, decided what to wear, how to pose, what stuff to bring with them. And they were engaged in this private narrative act, this, the, the creation of a picture with a story for them. No one wrote that story down. There's no explanatory key for this. And some of the greatest daguerreotypes are these fabulous little mysteries where um, the, 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 the story, whatever it is, is contained in this scene, but, but we can't like pry it out. And all we have left is this enigmatic, spirited, crazy, uh, unusual daguerreotype. Or this, well, you know, why, why was this made? Was he that proud of that new hat? Maybe. Um, this is clearer, woman holding a case daguerreotype and a valentine. And so I think it's a legitimate thing to guess that her lover, husband, boyfriend is somewhere else, has sent her a portrait of himself. She's gone to a studio holding that treasured object, showing him this symbol of affection, and this then went in the mail to him. I, I don't think that's pushing it. I think that those kinds of stories are part and parcel of a lot of these images. Uh, I, I think this is one of the most poetic and enigmatic uh, portraits that the psychology of the connection between these two people is a whole novel. I mean, someone could write a pretty good novel, I think, based on that. <laughs> the, these, I think, are a, a little more straightforward. I connect these with the temperance movement uh, which again is a bit of a guess, but here we have a guy pouring water, uh, saying, you know, I'm on the wagon, I'm just drinking water. The, the symbolism of a glass of water was more than just, I'm thirsty. And over here, holding what I presume to be a Bible, finger pointing to the heavens, and an uncorked, untouched bottle of wine there. It's not a temptation, you know. Um, but again, images like this, are more than just simple portraits as well. Many other subjects were recorded in the daguerreotype. The category of pictures within pictures is, is an especially interesting one that prods us to think about pictures themselves. Um, obviously, you see this is a painting. Um, why we make them and how we value them. Or this, a, da a daguerreotype of a um, painter who's painting a trompe l'oeil backdrop. So it's an image about the magic of the virtual image. Philosophically speaking, what is the reality of an, of an image as an index or trace of the visible world? In what way precisely is the image related to the physical thing it depicts? And then how is this relationship amplified by our ideas, memories, and emotions? It should go without saying that these are not questions of merely antiquarian interest. Um, either they're completely relevant to maybe even more relevant now that we're in the fully virtual image universe. This role of emotion and memory is central to the Victorian tradition of the post-mortem photograph, pictures of the dead. These images are an important reflection of the cultural mindset of the period. They were not created as morbid things. They're melancholy, for sure, but, but not morbid, and I think there is a real difference. These images suggest the largest issues of all, life, death, and spiritual faith. While profoundly sad, these images are about the struggle to accept the vicissitudes of fate and to honor the sacred value of every life. They were understood as an essential part of the personal and social process of grieving, and we don't begin to understand these images if we, and I'm not accusing anyone of this, but if, if anyone immediately categorizes them as just sentimental or morbid or whatever, we really um, aren't doing justice to them or to the world that they're coming from. Changing gears here a bit, we can also find daguerreotypes of animals, 
primarily pets. Um, these were challenging subjects, like babies and, and young kids, <clears throat> because it's hard to convince either a year-old baby or a cat to sit still for eight or 10 seconds. So these images are, are technical feats of a kind. This one is one of the greatest, showing a cat looking out a window, and the cat is just so mesmerized by whatever's out there that it is really just pretty much razor sharp. There's a little bit of movement in the ears, but otherwise, it's, it's quite astonishing that, that this was made. And the fact that someone paid to have this made. <laughs> Daguerreotypes were not free. They really represented an investment. And one of the major points here is to remember that images like this only existed, only were made because someone loved that cat um, or loved that new house or had powerful feelings about that deceased child. So all of these images express a profound sense of value. They were not made casually or accidentally. Uh, we also see outdoor views of various kinds. This, is, this was made in July of 1853 and historically is of extreme importance. It's one of the very first, and I want to say it's the first, but it's, it's really close. Let me just say it. It's the, it's the first photographic record of a newsworthy event in America. I deliberately don't use the word photojournalism because this was not literally re reproduced in a newspaper. But it's a, photo, it's a photographic record of a newsworthy event. The event was, was um, uh, written about endlessly. Title is Avery Stranded. Avery and his buddies got a little too drunk one night, got in a boat, and got a little too close to Niagara Falls. The boat was pulled over. Avery leaped out. The others were killed instantly. He hung on for 24 hours. And various rescue attempts were made that, I'm sorry to report, um, were not successful. He hung on for a day out there. Uh, this point, I mean, there, this, is, this is like, Sartre would have loved this. This is pure existentialism, you know, the human condition alone in a angry, tough world. I mean, yeah, okay, <laughs> that's what this is all about. Um, this was made by Platt Babbitt um, from one of those vantage points on the American side of the falls. Again, July 1853. Um, this is in the show, barn, A Barn Raising. A uh, very unusual subject, but absolutely wonderful, giving some sense of this overall context, the beginning of the work to create this barn. A New England town, I wish we knew where it was. Uh, we don't. Formally, I love the way it breaks into these graphic elements, this plane, the plane of the water, this plane. So it's like three separate sort of chunks of image, um, but a very bold kind of modern uh, feeling picture. And the California Gold Rush, of course, was um, extensively daguerreotyped. Um, outdoor work was much more difficult than indoor work, but there was money to be made in the gold fields, not just, oops, not just by the gold miners, but by the daguerreotypists that could get out there and to, and to make decent plates. They could charge five times the price. I mean, if someone had gold in their pocket, it really didn't matter what the price of that daguerreotype was. And so that attracted daguerreotypists, not surprisingly. And we see art being made, I mean, real art. Uh, this is David Collins, almost certainly a Philadelphia daguerreotypist. It's dated on the back 1842, which is really early. Um, magnificent image, uh, pretty much unique in American daguerreotypy that I've seen. The subject is familiar to us. It feels like a more European kind of subject. We see this kind of thing in British painting, French painting. Uh, but this absolutely is an American piece, uh, certainly playing off those kind of genre tra traditions. But the elegance of it, the technical quality of it, the, you know, the, this fabulous dog, you know, waiting by the window here, the rifle and everything. And the early date, 1842, is, is really kind of amazing. <clears throat> so artistic and, and allegorical works were also made, images that can't be understood as portraits or simple documents at all. Instead, these images involve subjects that are clearly found or created for the camera. Um, this is by Southworth and Hawes, the Boston daguerreotypist.
This is frost on their window. So this quite clearly was not made in the name of commerce. No one, no one would have paid them any money for a daguerreotype of the frost on their window. So they're either testing a plate or just playing around, experimenting on a slow day, or frankly, making an unusual picture for their gallery display wall, which, which was entirely possible. Um, but you know, this kind of image from probably about 1850, again, is the kind of thing that none of us knew was part of the history of early American photography until this one plate surfaced in 1999. Um, none of us have seen anything else like this, but okay, one's enough. One proves that these guys had this idea and made this incredibly unusual uh, image. Or images like this are not straightforward portraits. A schoolboy lost in thought. It feels like a painterly motif uh, with some kind of moral and message. You know, he should be studying, but he's daydreaming and so forth. But everything about it suggests a kind of artistic or allegorical or theatrical uh, kind of idea. Uh, the spirit of art here, uh, junior art at least. Or this weird trompe l'oeil piece with a, uh, a chessboard on this odd sort of book-ish sort of table that's on a cushion of some sort. Or this is on a table. So this is all three-dimensional with a closed daguerreotype case on the table. And then this flat trompe l'oeil um, two-dimensional folk art painting back here. So this play between image and dimensional stuff very curious. I, again, I, I don't really know what the message is here. I get some kind of message that, that relates to a post-mortem or a meditation on mortality or memory or something. But again, I think um, an maybe an interesting short story could be written on this one. Or the boys playing marbles, um, an astonishing piece. Uh, again, I've never seen anything like this taken on a real street, a real sidewalk. The kids are posed, of course. Um, the rest of it's set up, but this is a, a real place made outdoors, um, almost certainly you know, very close to the Daguerrean studio. You're not going to lug your equipment too far to make this, but the ambition, the desire to make in photographic form what is, in fact, a kind of high uh, genre scene concept, this kind of idea we see in the genre paintings of the 1830s and 1840s. Um, we, we don't see it much in the daguerreotype except for things like this. And then there are, there are comic daguerreotypes. Um, another aspect of the constructed subject uh, is the genre of the comic daguerreotype. Our Victorian ancestors were not humorless. Um, and the daguerreotypes of this era reveal what can only be called an irreverent, ironic, or even subversive sensibility. Uh, the, the great boy on the back of the chair here who gleefully subverts all the standards of good portraiture. Good portraiture begins by actually sitting in the chair, <laughs> not on the top, and then looking nice as opposed to making a face at the camera. So this, again, this is the exception that proves all kinds of rules. I've never seen another uh, plate really like this either. And again, that's the thing. These are one-of-a-kind things. And for every great piece that's lost, it's historical information gone forever. And that's why the, the collecting of these seems to me to be all the more important because every great piece we find adds something tangible and real and unique to our existing knowledge. Um, this I'm fascinated by. Um, this is a very beautifully orchestrated image about the chaos preceding the, the formal portrait. So this is a formal portrait of the group preparing for that. And you know they're doing each other's hair, and they're distracted, and they're looking here and there. And the woman in the front is basically going, no, no, wait, wait, we're not ready yet. And that becomes the portrait. So on a conceptual level, I find this really kind of amazing, that a formal portrait that isn't that. 
and yet it's orchestrated, it's set up to be that, so it is and it isn't at the same time. Or this, uh, which probably came out of some um, fairly rural studio. Uh, this doesn't seem like New York Broadway kind of work. We've got some hunters with their rifles and game of various kinds here. Um, of course, they are coming to a studio to make a certain kind of statement. They, they know what to expect. They know they're going to sit down, back their heads up into these cast iron headstands, and sit uncomfortably, yes, but you know, sit for eight or 10 seconds to, to make this image. Well, they're, they're playing around with this idea. Oops. Um, this is a stuffed owl on a stand, and the owl has been turned sideways, and its head has been placed in a little <laughs> headstand. So this owl is a symbol, a stand-in for these guys, and these guys are commenting on the wackiness of this process by doing what they're doing here. This is a hoot, um, <laughs> right? I mean, on s well, I'm sorry. It, it, it demanded to be said. Um, but this is so self-conscious. They're displaying this to the camera. They're making this joke. They're being daguerreotype. They're going to the ritual, but they're joking about the ritual at the same time. How, I mean, that's a very rich and interesting idea. Um, to push this idea a little bit further, we also find experimental images in the Daguerrean period. Um, this is one guy from four different uh, points of view. <clears throat> um, or multiple exposures that are, seem profoundly modernist in conception. The playing card motif done by making an exposure with a masked, a, a plate that's masked off, um, half of it is masked in the camera, and then you simply invert the play to shoot the other side. Um, these are pictures of things or people that are created, not recorded. And further, they are pictures that really could only have been made photographically. In painted form, this would, well, in painted form, you have a painting of a playing card motif, which is a very odd thing. I've, I've never seen that. Maybe it exists. But this, you know, the, the, the two-headed man, this is made very simply. If this was a 12-second exposure, he had his head on one shoulder for six seconds and then flipped it over for the other half of the exposure. So the, the mechanics of the daguerreotype process allow this virtual creation to be made. This is the photographic syntax, the photographic nature, its mechanism itself, speaking, or being allowed to speak, or encouraged to speak by daguerreotypists with an uncommon experimental bent. Daguerreotypists in combination with subjects that, that wanted to, to see this, wanted to play as well. In the end, I think that daguerreotypes' historical and artistic importance lies precisely in the rich variety of its subjects, its styles, and its ambitions. From images with an astonishing kind of experimental energy, such as that, to others of an equally astonishing poetic or even spiritual achievement. This image suggests to me the notion of the beautiful soul, a central thread of romantic era thought. The idea that beauty and goodness, the formal resolution of pictures, as well as the emotional and spiritual balance and integration of the self, were all intimately related. From this perspective, pictures were immensely important. In a perfect image of ourselves, we project not strictly how we are, but how we should be, how we might be, how we want to be. Our portrait thus becomes, in part, a reflection of the self we strive to become, a self-image and a goal that we strive to live up to. That's not a small idea. That's not a trivial idea or a quaint one. It's an idea with a much larger application that I think touches on a whole universe of pictures, how we think about them and what they mean to us. Um, this is the last plate in the show. So the daguerreotype lasted only 20 years, but what a pivotal foundational period this 20 years was. An image like this, titled A Showing of Daguerreotypes, suggests the deep pride the daguerreotypists of the period took in their work. They loved the process, they were fascinated by it, 
and they were immensely proud of what they could do with it. Many were profoundly saddened to see it pushed aside after only two decades by the public preference for cheaper, easier, and more flexible processes. The daguerreotype ultimately could not compete. Its only virtue was perfection, a perfection we are still coming to understand and appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Did anybody uh, attempt to deliberately uh, show motion? And you showed the example of the water that demonstrated some motion. And then the great man of song so that the man of white shoes would walk down the dark and we had maybe five seconds of his motion. Mm -hmm. But that all seems unintentional. Did anybody ever try and demonstrate motion by repeatedly breaking somebody or an object? That's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, one, uh, nothing obvious leaps to mind. In other words, putting a guy in a white suit in the sun and then having him watch so he get this caterpillar form. I, I have never seen that in the period. What I have seen, Thomas Easterly photographed lightning at night, which you know, required him to just, you know, on a stormy night, to get the camera set up and then just open the shutter. So it was open for minutes and minutes and minutes. And he was collecting the lightning strikes. That's uh, 1847 or 48, something like that, but qu quite early. No, what you're suggesting is very interesting. Um, I'm not pulling anything to mind. I'd love to see such a thing. And I, I wouldn't rule any possibility out. Um, but I, I just haven't seen such a thing yet. Yeah. Oh, these plates have gotten scattered all over the place. Um, most of the most of the existing daguerreotypes that are available for sale or whatever are in collections at this point. I mean, there just isn't much great material, well, there's hardly any great material in, in flea markets and so forth that, that I've had the luck to find. There are great things out there, but um, um, to, as far as I have seen, most of them are in the hands of collectors or dealers at this point. Um, there's the Daguerrean Society, do you know of that group that has an annual meeting? The whole society, I'm, I'm a member, I'm a former board member, um, so you know, um, it's, it's legit, more or less. Um, they, the the Garen Society has been in existence for 25 years and has an annual conference. Uh, 14 was in Austin, Texas. 15 is in LA. Um, and every one of those, we, we hosted the show in, at the group in 01 and 07 when we did big shows. And every one of those Daguerrean Society annual conferences has a big trade fair where there's tables and tables and tables of daguerreotypes. Yeah. You use the term quarter plate, half plate, or full plate. Mm -hmm. Could you expand upon that, please? Well, those are the standard sizes. A whole plate was six and a half by eight and a half. So a half plate is half of that, basically. A quarter plate is four coming out of that. A six plate is six coming out of that. But the, the, the standard was the six and a half by eight and a half inch whole plate. Whole plate daguerreotypes are fairly rare because they were pricey. They, they were much more expensive. They were harder to make, took different equipment, bigger cameras and so forth. Um, the, the daguerreotype, as I showed with the two cameras piggybacked, the bottom one was probably only a half plate camera and that's not small. Um, but yeah, that, that's what those sizes come from. How was the silver applied to the copper plate? You begin with a copper plate. Silver was um, uh, typically applied by cladding the plate, that is um, in, a, in a steel, in a metal works factory essentially, uh, rolling uh, silver pretty thin and then physically bonding it to the surface of the copper. That gave you a good meaty cross section of silver. Daguerreotype has then often um, improved the surface by electroplating 
that silver surface. Uh, electrically electroplating, de depositing a very fine layer of added silver. So cladding and electroplating individually or more commonly in combination. Yeah. Uh, you said that it's a reverse image. It's a mirror image. How did they get the lettering on some of those to read properly? Well, that's a good question. A, a, a daguerreotype is naturally a reversed image, is naturally a mirror image, but you could compensate for that by putting a prism over your lens to reverse the image that will be reversed by your lens. Um, it typically costs you about a stop's worth of exposure, so it added a little bit of time, but especially with architectural subjects, if you're photographing a building and you wanted the sign to read properly, there was really no reason to not put your reversing prism on. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you mention, and maybe I missed it, which one was the first two? Uh, well, it was actually the Recife Brazil image. Um, because, um, well, I don't want to take too much time here, but um, this whole initiative began. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Boy, it's just as good in reverse, isn't it? <laughs> so many favorites here. Uh, okay, uh, sorry. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Um, our 19th century initiative began with the purchase of this print. This was purchased out of APAD, the annual fair, which was February of 1995. I got it off a dealer's wall. It's unique. It's one of a kind. It's, it's a astonishingly great. Um, it's, it's an early salt print, early wet collodion. You can see the, the effects of all that. Um, so I was really pleased to get this. And it's the Frederick Studio, of course. And another dealer who saw that I'd gotten this said, you should come visit me tomorrow. So I said, okay, fine. And he pulled out a couple of Frederick's daguerreotypes that had sold in London eh, 12 years earlier. And um, that... So this plate came the next day. The Frederick's paper print on a Thursday or whatever it was, and then the Frederick's daguerreotype uh, the, the following day. And that, we, we kind of got off a nice running start there. So I've always had a fond place for C.D. Frederick's. Um, but yeah, this was, this was the first one. Um, part of what was interesting to me, I mean, it's just a perfect whole plate. The, 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 the location is fascinating, and part of the story it tells, of course, is the fact that the best American daguerreotypists were international business people. Um, Fredericks had, a, had studios in Recife and, and further on down. He had a studio in Havana for a while, and he had a, a part of a studio in Paris for a while. And in fact, um, the, the great paper print came out of Paris. Uh, there were no examples in America of these. There was two variants of this, both in a great French collection. One ended up at the Getty, and then we have the other. They're different views. Um, they're the same facade. Ours is from this angle, and the Getty's is from about 30 yards down the street looking back the other way. And it's really a different picture. But these both came out of Paris. And so that notion of the great American daguerreotypists as anything but provincial, you know, they are, the best of them are international business people. Operations in Paris, Havana, you name it. Brady and company, you know, showing, getting awards in the, in the great 1851 Crystal Palace exhibition in London and so forth. These, these were, these were um, important figures, incredibly well respected in their day. Um, technically uh, amazingly capable, artistically minded. Uh, they had to have enough business skills to, you know, to, to get, keep the business going. They were, um, they were pretty interesting folks. And uh, they did incredible work. So at any rate, that's, I'm on a tangent, but, but that's how that began, yeah, tw exactly 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the maps, do you know much about that? Or I, I can see some of the business people charging more for some of the cases of maps than they do for the photos. Do you know what's good for that or not? 
Well, uh, the mats and cases were commercially made. Um, the daguerreotypists could choose, you know, what mat designs to use and what case designs to use. Uh, there are people that co have collected cases um, from the from the get go. Matter of fact, 50, 60, 80 years ago, there were probably more case collectors than daguerreotype collectors, and so there's stories about people finding a great daguerreotype, saying, "Oh, this case is so nice. Who cares about the daguerreotype?" Where, where today, um, you know, anyone that did that would be, well, we would not look favorably upon, favorably upon that. Um, but I, I'm glad you commented on, on our exhibition equipment up there. We, we've worked very hard. This is actually the fourth generation of the display cases. We did our first daguerreotype show in 2001 in Kansas City. And then we revised the display cases for an 03 exhibition at the Chicago Art Institute. We revised them again for the 07 show that Patricia commented on at the museum. And we've revised them again for, for, for this activity. So uh, we, we and our engineers have put a lot of thought into the best possible way to see these things. And uh, I, I, I think we can display them better than anyone else can. And, and that. I think that alone opens people's eyes because everyone's handled these things, but we haven't seen we haven't seen so many great ones, and we haven't seen them under anything like optimal conditions. And when you don't see the great ones and you don't see them properly, you're not going to be terribly impressed. Other than these are old, but that's that's the least of my concerns. The fact that they're old. Uh, question here. Were the color added in yeah, the the color typically is added in. Um, Sometimes you see blue skies, solarization that, that happens um, just as an artifact of the process itself. When any area of a daguerreotype is grossly overexposed, it tends to go blue. Um, but any clothing or coloring of cheeks, that, that's hand, that's added by hand. Would yeah. Done yeah. Uh, yeah, it would have been done in their studio. Yeah. Uh, one back here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the great ones. Um, I think the world record for any single daguerreotype is uh, pretty close to a million dollars. Nine hundred plus, nine hundred thousand plus. Um, um, uh, a very early 1842 or three view of um, Middle East uh, ruins of one kind or another, whether it was done in Egypt. But the, the greatest existing daguerreotypes, um, I mean, other than ours, <laughs> haven't, ha haven't come up for sale. I mean, I could, if that one went for a million, I could easily show you one that I think is worth 10 million. But, you know, these numbers are, are weird. There, there's an awful lot that one can do. I mean, you can find really nice $50 daguerreotypes. Um, in our show, plates range from things that cost less than $1,000 to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so it's, it's a fairly generous spectrum there. What percentage are we seeing of the collection? Uh, well, we've got 82, 82 so that's, that's about 10%, 8 or 9%. We, we're, we're getting close to about 1,000. So, but this is, this, is, uh, this is a nice tip of the iceberg here, for sure. Um, there are probably collections with more. The, the, the point is, how good are they, though? The, the numbers alone don't, don't tell you what you need to know. Yeah. Uh, I have a question on the cases also. We have two personal uh, daguerreotypes in cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a thermoplastic. Um, the, the gutta perch or thermoplastic comes in around 54, 1854, 55. So late 50s, a lot of daguerreotypes are in plastic cases. And it's, it's one of the very first uses of, of uh, commercial plastic. It's actually sawdust and lacquer and a lot of other stuff put into molds, heated, and formed. But yeah, they are plastic. 
Yeah, the, you see those in the mid to late 50s. Okay. You never see them in the 40s. Okay. They, they really come in around 54-ish or so. Yeah, Thank you. sure. Yes? Good question. Um, daguerreotypes are astonishingly stable if you don't physically mess with them. The, the greatest damage to plates, uh, really, of any kind, uh, well, mercifully, I'm not finding examples of messed up daguerreotypes here. Uh, that's just uh, um, the, the greatest danger is physical abuse. Um, they're under glass, but as soon as someone opens the case up, and starts doing anything to that surface, there's a danger that they're going to really mess it up. Um, there's been some debate in the last decade about the light sensitivity of the daguerreotype surface. My contention is that they're not light sensitive, period. They're, they're among the most robust photographic images ever made. A, a modern daguerreotypist friend of mine gleefully told me this story. Um, for 12 months, for one year, he took a vintage daguerreotype, covered half of it with heavy black tape, put it in a south-facing window. It faced daylight, sunlight, direct sun for a year, one year, which in terms of comparable exposure times to the exhibition we're doing here would be at least 10,000 years um, on display. And after one year, he took it down, opened it up. I actually would have expected some difference, some effect. There was no visible effect from a year's worth of sunlight exposure. That's astonishing. No contemporary photograph could survive that with no change at all. So we're talking about an astonishingly robust um, image um, in terms of light exposure. Um, silver tarnishes and the package that daguerreotypes come in prevent airflow. Um, but if a plate is exposed, it's opening, you know, we're opening up to tarnish. Tarnish can be removed, but, you know, the more stuff that happens to that surface, the more compromise is possible. But in terms of light uh, uh, resistance, um, there's nothing better, which is surprising. I, again, I was very surprised by this experiment. Yeah. If you wanted, now there are people today who you could go to and say, I want a daguerreotype of Franklin Roosevelt, and they would. Sure. Yeah, there, there are um, two daguerreotypists that I think are basically as good as the greatest daguerreotypists of the 1850s My, uh, Jerry Spagnoli in New York City and Mike Robinson in Toronto, and they both do portrait sittings. Um, they're both brilliant daguerreotypists, totally brilliant, and they know, um, they know more than anyone on earth about this process that's lived since the year 1900. And how much would your trip pay? Well, a couple thousand dollars probably for a sitting, but, you know, uh, if you go to any good portraitist in New York City, you're, you're going to pay that, something like that. But th they're great. They're, they're really supremely great. And there's another eight or ten folks around the world that are good and, and do portraits. Um, whether or not they can nail it on one try, like Mike or Jerry, you know, is up for debate. But um, if, if you want a daguerreotype portrait of yourself made, it's, it's doable. It's, it's definitely doable. I just want to thank you for this show and encourage you to do this as marketing. Well, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for coming out. I, again, my thanks to the museum for putting this on. Um, I hope that I've spread a little bit of the Daguerrean gospel here tonight. <laughs> thank you.